안녕하십니까? Good morning, everyone. 아, 오늘 한반도 국제 평화 포럼 2021에 우리 그 경남대학교의 So every year, the Ministry of Unification hosts this forum, and IFES also moderated a session last year, and it gives me great honor to host another session this year. We have many professors with us today who will take part as panelists and presenters, but uh, I would like to emphasize that we have many fellows from other countries, from Europe as well as the US. So uh, we will also hear from those presenters. So we will hear from two fellows uh, from overseas, and uh, we will have other international fellows who will take part as panelists as well. So um, in session 1-2, we will hear from two presenters. The first presenter is research fellow Eva Motilinska, who will talk about the cooperation initiatives and its impact on the Korean Peninsula. So in Korea so far, uh, we've seen many different cooperation initiatives between the two Koreas, um, which uh, was developed to bring peace on the Korean Peninsula. So we would like to hear from Ms. Eva about what the global cases uh, can teach us in terms of implications. We will also hear from Mr. Hirai Hisashi, who is an expert in inter-Korean relationships and issues. And he's also a visiting research fellow at IFES. He will talk about uh, the US-North Korea relations to date, and also the role of Japan in the talk between the US and North Korea and the way forward when it comes to the relations between Korea, Japan, China, and the US. So that will be the focus of Hirai Sang's presentation. Um, because we have uh, not enough time, uh, please make sure that uh, you keep your presentation on time. And uh, the panelists uh, will uh, provide commentaries for about five minutes each. Then without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Eva Motilinska, our visiting research fellow, for her presentation. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Director Lee, for your kind introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, selected cases of transboundary collaboration projects in Europe and possible lessons for the Korean Peninsula and the Northeast Asia region. Uh, Next, I would like to introduce uh, Hirai Sang. Hello, my name is Hirai Hisashi. Hello. I'm from Japan. It's a great pleasure to meet you all. Next, uh, let me introduce the panelists we have with us. Uh, Mr. Pavel M. from Russia. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Next, we have one fellow from China. We have Ms. Liang Mihua. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Liang Mihua from China. Next, uh, we have an uh, IFES professor, Professor Zhou Jinggu. Hello, everyone. My name is Zhou Jinggu, and I teach at IFES, Gyeongnam University. It's a pleasure to meet you all. 
Last but not least, we have with us uh, Professor Yi yeah, Byung Tol uh, from IFES. Hello, everyone. My name is Yi Byung Tol. With that, uh, we would like to kickstart the presentation. The floor is yours, uh, Ms. Eva. You will have 15 minutes, so please uh, be on time. Thank you very much once again. And just to introduce my uh, presentation, as probably all of you gathered here perfectly know, the history of the European continent is mainly history of wars. Uh, nevertheless, after those conflicts, small-scale collaboration projects started in the border areas between former enemies. These projects often started as a limited bilateral setups to grow into multilateral arrangements and contributed to further institutional integration on the continent. Also, the European Union is the effect of such a liberal experiment. The history of European transboundary collaboration could serve as a benchmark and some lessons uh, could be also learned for the region, other regions of the world, uh, including Northeast Asia. First case I would like to talk about is peaceful settlement of maritime conflict between Iceland and Norway. In 1979, Norway claimed the right to establish exclusive economic zone around the island of Jan Mayen, located just 400 miles north of Iceland. Since fishery is the most important industry in Iceland, the Icelandic government strongly opposed. Norway didn't want to lose its international image of peaceful country, so eventually both countries complied with their legal obligation to cooperate. We can say that in case of Norway, in that case, Norway chose values over interest. By acting hostile toward Iceland, Norway would destroy its international image, but also could undermine the security, the security in the whole region. Aland Archipelago historically was a part of Sweden with Swedish-speaking population. However, after Finland gained independence from Russia in 1917, it started to claim the islands. Diplomatic cries emerged when in 1920, the Finnish government adopted a law on Aland's autonomy that didn't satisfy Alanders. Helsinki sent troops and Stockholm recalled its diplomats. The dispute was handed over to the League of Nations for arbitration. Aland was granted a high level of autonomy. Additionally, it was reaffirmed with the treaty admitting Finland to the EU. An interesting fact is nowadays Aland serves as a popular tourist destination for both Swedish and Finnish visitors. The next case is not really post-conflict cooperation case, but the particular cooperation project between Denmark and Sweden shows the cooperation in border areas needs to be done on every level, from local community level to supranational bodies. Oresund is a 119 long strait between Denmark and Sweden, through which around 9,000 commuters commute on an everyday basis. There are two elements that made this cross-border communicating possible. The construction of the bridge between the two countries and the implementation of the clear policy strengthening cooperation. It's one of the most economically robust regions in Europe.
The infamous so-called Black Triangle was a border region long characterized by extremely high level of pollution, mainly due to a high number of coal mines and textile factories. The cooperation between the three countries, Czech Republic, Germany, and Poland, became possible only after the collapse of the Soviet Union and political transformation that started in 1989. During the four decades of the Cold War, the borders between the Eastern Bloc countries and the West were heavily fortified. Like the DMZ, the creation of the stripe of land largely devoid of human occupation and development became a refuge for many species of birds, animals, and plants. Over 43 years later, the Iron Curtain was finally raised in a series of events that included the highly symbolic opening of the Berlin Wall in November 1989. Exactly one month after the opening of Berlin Wall, some 300 environmentalists from East and West Germany met to pass a resolution to preserve this green belt before it was reoccupied and developed. The green belt consists of four regional sections and the backbone of pan-European ecological network that runs through 24 countries and over 12,000 kilometers from the Barents Sea in the north to the Adriatic and Black Sea in the south. I would like to sum up this part of my presentation with a couple of final thoughts. First of all, Conflict transformation is a long process without any clear path to success. Secondly, not only common interests between the parties, but also common values can make cooperation feasible. Thirdly, and I think most importantly, without political will, any international cooperation is hardly possible. However, bilateral cooperation initiatives incorporated under multilateral arrangements could be enhanced and may become feasible. Now, and with this last point, I would like to ask another question. Is there any kind of bilateral cooperation between South and North Korea? Bilateral? Not, I'm aware of. But multinational, multilateral, yes. One of the platforms for cooperation between North and South Korea is East Asian Australasian Flyaway Partnership. Just to briefly mention, the East Asian Australasian Flyaway Partnership aims to protect migratory water birds, their habitat, and the livelihood of people dependent upon them. As it partners, EAFP gathers national governments, AGOs, NGOs, and international private enterprises. Both North and South Korea's are EFAP's partners. Also, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, that appeared on the screen briefly when I was talking about European Green Belt, is a partner of EFP. I mentioned before the significance of political will in facilitating international cooperation. While talking about cooperation between former or adversary parties, we often talk about so-called trust building process. And in the context of Korean Peninsula, we tend to think that it mainly depend, it's mainly needed in the north. 
However, this document sent by the Ministry of Environment, Republic of Korea, saying that South Korean government doesn't agree on North Korean joining the East Asian Australasian Flyaway Partnership due to some past issues, so show that the trust building process is needed on the both sides of the DMZ. Those are only some outcomes of North-South collaboration within the framework of the partnership. National Wetlands Inventory published in 2018 enhanced skills and knowledge among North Korean specialists. The DPRK is now conducting an update on National Wetlands Inventory with modern methodology based on scientific standards. Awareness rising activities such, tr such as uh, translation of Ramsar Convention, handbooks uh, and other uh, events like celebrating of International Environmental Days, uh, Razon trade uh, exhibitions and so on, support a better understanding for healthy ecosystems among official, students, media and especially actors on the local levels. Regular participation of representatives of the DPRK in international meetings, conference, and workshops is also one of the outcomes of uh, cooperation within the framework of the partnership. Last thing I would like to mention is a matter of red seaweed, a highly important when it comes to medical science research. When a couple of years ago, Moroccan government decided to cut the annual production by half, scientists from all over the world started looking for alternative sources of the precious ingredient. Researchers identified Ongjin County in North Korea as an excellent place for onland seaweed cultivation due to its tidal range and tidal flats. However, research community concluded that it is impossible to make business with North Korea as it's isolated and closed countries. But let's take a moment here. What if we bring together multinational stakeholders? What if we engage supranational organizations and individual actors? From one side, North Korea can benefit financially from this kind of arrangement but on the other hand, it gets exposure to international values and international community. Also, it has to guarantee a certain degree of transparency. And that might be seen as a small step, but on the other hand, hasn't Helsinki process leading to political transformation in Europe started as a series of small non-political steps, small non-political projects? And with those questions, I would conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Eva, for the presentation. You talked about the transboundary uh, cooperation in Europe and its implication uh, to us on the Korean Peninsula. So Eva talked about uh, concrete examples of conflict re resolution uh, leading to collaboration and cooperation uh, that can be found in many countries uh, such as Poland, Germany, uh, Portugal, Spain, and uh, Denmark, Sweden, and so forth. And in the, the inter-Korean relations, you also talked about uh, international, uh, multinational cooperation and uh, utilizing environmental issues as a way to cooperate. And she also emphasized uh, the importance of political will and uh, that both sides need to participate in the trust building process. And uh, such trust building can lay the foundation for transboundary collaboration. As a divided country, we are in a ceasefire situation, and for a long time we have carried out uh, exchanges both on the um, private 
level and also uh, goods and people have been exchanged. And uh, through this process, we were able to uh, build up some trust and uh, this should lead to a exchange of uh, political exchanges and so forth. And we know that there were turmoils in the process. However, we were able to go on ahead and uh, we heard about European cases of conflict that have been transformed formed to collaboration projects. Then let's go on to the next presentation. Um, Hirai sashi san uh, will talk about Biden's North Korea policy, the North Korean nuclear issue, and Japan's role. You have 15 minutes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hirai. I will begin my presentation. So as introduced by the moderator, I uh, will talk about Biden's North Korea policy concerns over North Korea's nuclear programs and Japan's role. But uh, since uh, these are all grand topics, I would like to focus my presentation on Japan's role. So uh, the U.S. and North Korea talked about nuclear programs, and uh, I think that we can learn from the May-U.S.-Korea summit about what the U.S. and North Korea seek. So uh, during the U.S.-Korea summit, uh, the two leaders uh, said that they will emphasize alliances and give priority to diplomacy with North Korea. So it's more of a soft approach that they are willing to take with respect to North Korea. However, what Biden wants to do is to be flexible towards negotiations but stick to principles. So it will maintain the existing stance with respect to the issues that North Korea perceives as hostile policy. And Biden hasn't changed its stance uh, towards North Korea in that matter. Of course, uh, he said that he was willing to negotiate and that he was open to dialogue, but I believe that he still uh, stuck to the principles. So that would be uh, the key to the policy towards North Korea that Biden laid out. However, then what will be, how much is the U.S. willing to compromise with respect to North Korea is still unknown. So we are yet to find out the details about uh, the exact approach that the U.S. is willing to take towards North Korea. Of course, uh, North Korea is not willing to uh, have a dialogue with the U.S., but the U.S. Uh, said that the administration was still open to dialogue. But in the meantime, as you know, uh, the Taliban uh, seized power in Afghanistan, and that topped the priority list of the Biden administration. So uh, it is my projection that the list on the Biden's agenda will be reshuffled. And against this backdrop, I don't think that North Korea will be Biden's top priority for the foreseeable future. So we still uh, need to wait and see what will happen. Uh, about 2,500 lost their lives after um, because of the Afghanistan war. 
But still, uh, NATO did not uh, play its role in that process. And NATO is failing to uh, do its job. And that led to a casualty of over about 1,000 uh, from NATO's member countries, including 455 from the UK. And uh, this goes against the spirit of alliance. This shows uh, that uh, the US is placing America first before other countries. Then what is North Korea's position? The agenda is quite packed uh, for the regime. It has been conducting various meetings, and it feels like uh, there's been some changes in the regime. And uh, North Korea press, such as Nodong Shinmun, a uh, daily newspaper, uh, has been releasing articles about the changing policies of the regime. But then on the other side, uh, we are seeing decreasing uh, level of activities uh, from the chairman. So when it comes to the supervision on the site, then the officials of the party uh, takes charge and not the chairman himself. Now, of course, we see this change of uh, supervision and the, it's more of a responsibility sharing type of supervision uh, rather than delegation. In that sense, uh, the top leader can avoid accountability and can reprimand uh, the person in charge. And I think that will be uh, the way forward for North Korea. Against this uh, backdrop, uh, the regime still suffers from the economic sanctions, uh, COVID-19 control, and the shrinking trade with China. So it faces triple shocks and crises, which led to domestic problems as well. This means that North Korea uh, has no room to have a dialogue with the other countries in terms of denuclearization. And recently, the communication hotline was resumed between the two Koreas. But uh, now we are thinking that it was a mere gesture to again cut off the hotline. And military provocation um, is not an option for North Korea because it can provocate, um, provoke the US. But I believe that North Korea resumed uh, the hotline to raise questions. And the U.S. troop pulled out from Afghanistan. So given this, by cutting off the hotline, I believe that North Korea is attempting to go back and uh, to repeat history. So it is repeating itself and its behaviors of the past. So while uh, we await for next year's election, I believe that North Korea uh, might take a milder position 
in the foreseeable future. And because of this, it will be difficult for the U.S. and North Korea to uh, sit at a negotiation table and take talks seriously. But I think that North Korea uh, wants to find out more about the intention of Washington. And I think that led to North Korea restarting its Yongbyon facility because it wants to use the facility as a negotiation card uh, when talking with the U.S. Now this is about uh, Korea. Uh, since 2018, uh, Korea played a huge role in the talk between Washington and Pyongyang. And we talk a lot about the driver's seat theory, but uh, this does not tell everything the terminology itself. So the U.S. and North Korea are two uh, different counterparts uh, that have to take responsibility of their negotiations. But anyways, um, after the collapse of the Singapore summit, uh, inter-Korean relations deteriorated. So today I would like to focus on Japan's role. Before uh, Japan enjoyed vibrant trade with North Korea, and this is from 2001, and you can see um, how the figure rose to 17.7 in 2001. And after 2010, you see a sharp drop, but then uh, in 2002, it was 12.7, 2003, 8.5. And Japan actually uh, decreased the level of transaction with North Korea. And as you can see here, you see that in the past, we had people from uh, the Tongyeon trading with each other. However, that's no longer the case. So we see a sharp reduction in Japan's role uh, with respect to North Korea. And uh, Japan does not have or yield a direct influence on North Korea. But up to 2017, uh, there was regular behind-the-door contact between the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the North Korean authorities. But that's no longer the case. And under Abe administration, the cabinet secretary secretly contacted North Korea, but after the collapse of Hanoi summit, uh, the relations uh, was itself severed as well. And Prime Minister Abe uh, devoted most of his speech attacking North Korea at the 72nd UNGA, and now Suga took office, and the main principle is that Suga will succeed Abe's North Korea policy. And Suga is uh, not likely to change Abe's North Korea policy despite a uh, demand from the outside. So Japan has little room uh, to meddle in between North Korea and the U.S. However, we are faced with another challenge, which is the memoir published by Bolton. 
And he uh, talks in detail and discloses in detail about what happened between North Korea and the U.S. And if you read the memoir, you can find out all the details uh, about the conversation between Bolton and Yachi from Japan. And you can see how much Japan's intention uh, was actually reflected in the dialogue between the U.S. and North Korea. And Japan opposes South Korean government having influence over the North Korean regime. And uh, the memoir talks a lot about, you know, how Yachi was against uh, South Korea increasing its presence and influence over North Korea. And when it comes to the level of influence, we can tell that Japan still has much power in persuading the U.S. And the U.S. actually uh, hears out what Japan has to say. And this is likely to continue. So what I would, what I would like to ask to uh, Korea is this. So it's not about um, putting each other in check in terms of how much the U.S. can influence other countries. But I think that the U.S. and Korea should have more dialogues about North Korea. And the same should go for uh, Japan and Korea. They have to exchange ideas very seriously to make progress. And I think the absence of such dialogue is a cause behind the deterioration of relationship between the two countries. Because I'm pressed for time, I will skip this part. But it's highly likely that um, the power will change in uh, Japan next March and Korea. And we should not repeat the same mistake that Moon and Suga made in the beginning of the administration. Thank you very much for that. I would like to wrap up my presentation. Yes, thank you very much, Hirai Sang, for the presentation. Hirai Sang talked about uh, the history of the inter Korean relations as well as the changes within the uh, North Korean regime and uh, laid out some views about what we should do uh, to make progress in terms of the inter-Korean relations and other countries as well. So Korea, the U.S. and Japan should cooperate, and Korea and Japan should work closely to convince uh, the U.S. talk with North Korea and make progress. And so far, under the Trump administration, uh, we saw two talks between the U.S. and North Korea. And at the time, Japan actually had much to say. And since the U.S. is likely to continue its confrontation with China, then this gives all the more reason for Korea, the U.S. and Japan to work together uh, given this dynamics. 
and these countries should work together to not only resolve the pressing issues but also to move uh, beyond uh, the challenges. And in October this year, uh, Japan will hold its national election and South Korea will have its election next year. And this will also have much implications on the future of the relationship between these countries. So we heard from Eva and the Trans-Border Cooperation Initiatives in Europe to talk about the conflicts in the continent. And Hira Isang talked about the international dynamics and the relationship between not only the two Koreas, but also uh, Korea, Japan, and Korea, the US, and Japan. So he gave us uh, many food for, um, food for thought. Because we are pressed for time, uh, we would like to continue on with the panel discussion. Thank you very much for keeping time. Uh, as I said, uh, the panelists uh, will have five minutes each to provide commentary or to provide suggestions or feedback or ask questions. First, we will hear from Dr. Um, then Professor Chu jin gu uh, Dr. Yang, and Professor Yi byung -chul. You will have five minutes each. Thank you, Director Lee. Uh, thank you, Eva, for this um, interesting uh, I think fresh uh, view for this uh, very old problem of inter-Korean uh, cooperation and uh, attempt to uh, build a peace in Korean Peninsula. Uh, I want to uh, begin this uh, discussion with the question, like with the crucial question for this issue, like in what extent the East European or West European example could be applicable for Korean Peninsula. You know, because even there are many similarities between East European countries and North Korea in historical perspective, we still have different countries with different culture, different societies, etc. So I think when we're trying to compare East European countries with North Korea, we all always have to be cautious and we have to take like or even like mention a small note about like in what extent we can compare in every specific field these two regions. Uh, my second point is that I think like, you know, uh, to be honestly talking like cooperation uh, is something like between two parties and two parties like the cooperation itself, it should be like both beneficial, you know, trustful. And the problem uh, between North Korea and the rest of the world is my, in my mind is that first of all, uh, the lack of the trust. But I think like, you know, the world uh, and like all the neighboring countries with North Korea, the main problem is that they mainly specifically focus on economic cooperation. Uh, however, there are many other ways, as you mentioned, like about this uh, international organizations trying to research the migratory roads for uh, wild geese, right? So I think like actually the environmental cooperation in on Korean Peninsula could be a um, fruitful beginning for, you know, to make this cooperation stronger. Like for example, like we know all the uh, environmental problems of both Koreas, which includes like air pollution, deforestation, soil uh, degradation, uh, problems with uh, biodiversity, waste management. And I think like, I know that there are many sanctions from the United Nations, uh, but uh, I still believe there are many ways and many alternative ways to, you know, to try to build this cooperation between North Korea and the rest of the world. Um, and my, the third thing I need to point is that I know maybe you didn't mention it because of the lack of the time, but I think like this is important thing. It has to be mentioned that actually North Korea tried 
made many efforts to create the economic, to you know, to build the economic cooperation with uh, the, all the neighboring countries, actually, uh, South Korea, China, and Russia, uh, because like even mentioning all this specific uh, special economic zones they created, but uh, these projects actually were kind of frozen, right? All of them, even in manufacture or tourism fields. And uh, I also need to mention here that maybe like um, the projects in fishing or biodiversity secure, security may be also be, uh, some uh, points of beginning between the cooperation of two Koreas. And um, f from the methodological way, I uh, want to maybe advise you to use, or maybe to just to, you know, to check if it's applicable for you, uh, the idea of socioeconomic gradients on the frontier zones. Because, you know, um, if uh, actually there are so many papers I googled yesterday and uh, about this socioeconomic cooperation on the frontier zone in Eastern, uh, between Eastern and Western Europe uh, before the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And this, I think, I believe, could be very fruitful for your research as well. And um, I want to conclude my uh, like short speech with the um, point that the history knows many examples of uh, successful cooperation between uh, socialist and capitalist countries uh, in many fields, not only in economic. So I believe that maybe this long waiting uh, and desirable from both sides of Korean Peninsula peace talk, the real talk, right, the trustful talk, could start from this cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, M. Bavel. In a very short time, you pointed out many important points. And for the two questions that were asked, uh, Eva, after we hear from the other panelists, can have an opportunity to answer. And uh, on the, the case of the West and East Germany and the uh, Western and uh, Eastern blocks, how their cooperation can provide lessons for both sides. Such questions were asked and also uh, he mentioned uh, the importance of including other areas such as environment uh, in the cooperation projects and we should not focus just on the economy. And uh, he talked about uh, many proposals that he, uh, he talked about some proposals uh, and he also mentioned that North Korea had designated special economic zones and uh, that we may be able to think about areas that uh, can be beneficial to North Korea too. And uh, despite the limited time, I think he mentioned many interesting points. And uh, we would like to ask Eva to answer the two questions. And we will go on to Dr. Jo. Thank you very much. Because I don't have much time, I will be brief. So thank you very much, Eva, for your presentation. It was very interesting. We heard many concrete cases, and therefore it was very interesting. However, just as Dr. Um, Babel mentioned, we cannot apply directly the experience of Europe in Northeast Asia and on the Korean Peninsula. There are some questions on this. Just as Babel Um has mentioned, it's important to benefit both sides. And I think that it's important to first have trust, and we do not have that yet. Uh, Eva talked about many cases in Europe, and in the conclusion, she mentioned that the common interest without that and without trust we cannot have cooperation and international collaboration and political will is a must without it we cannot have a collaboration
cooperation. In addition, she mentioned international cooperation frameworks. And if we focus in this area, I think we can find some ways to overcome the situation. On the political will, on the efforts made by both sides, uh, we heard about the political will, and on the EAAF. P. On North Korea participating as a partner of EAAFP, the Ministry of Environment had sent a letter that North Korea should not become a partner. And so in this time period, this was the end of the Park Geun-hye administration. And after the Moon administration took office, um, I think things have changed. And so there have been changes. And if you consider that the timing of this letter was right before there was a change in the government, we can uh, check and identify that political will indeed is important, that it demonstrates without the political will, we cannot go forward. And with the Kim Jong-un administration, uh, international cooperation, and uh, in Korea, we use the word normal state. And if North Korea tries to become a normal state, and uh, we heard from Hirashi Sang about uh, the uh, governance through meetings and conferences, and uh, that uh, it is no longer a ruling uh, by one dictator that there are committees or ministers that uh, are taking responsibility and ownership of their specific areas. And if we consider such changes of the Kim Jong-un regime, we can sense a change in the Kim Jong-un regime compared to his father and grandfather. And uh, this may lead to changes in perspectives from the international society. For example, in the EAAFP partnership, when North Korea wanted to become a partner, it was in 2016 January, and then in 2018 April, they were accepted as a partner. And for the Ramsar Convention, uh, North Korea participated after the Kim Jong-un administration took office. And then in 2021, uh, July 14, uh, at uh, the HLPF, Song De Kim even submitted the BNR Voluntary National Review about uh, how North Korea will work on achieving the SDGs by 2030. And so DPRK even submitted an VNR in 2021, the GDP and the uh, like uh, penetration of cell phones, such uh, statistics were provided. So uh, we can see DPRK trying to become a state on the international uh, stage, uh, providing such uh, statistics and be more transparent. There are 161 countries in which DPRK has diplomatic ties with. So if a DPRK shows more active participation, then they can have more diplomatic relations with various countries. And on the transboundary collaboration, we heard about its importance. And in Northeast Asia, there are a couple of uh, institutes, uh, such as the Trilateral uh, Mi Environmental Ministers Framework and uh, Northeast Asia. Uh, Northeast Asia. Um, Environment Committee, NEAC, and there is the Northeast Asia Environment Cooperation Program. So if you think about Northeast Asia, there is China, Mongolia, Japan, and the Korean Peninsula. And out of these various environmental collaboration uh, efforts, EASPC, this is the only one that North Korea is participating in. 
So environment issue is transboundary, and it enables transboundary collaboration, and it benefits all. So we, I think we should try to include North Korea in these various environmental um, collaboration efforts. There should be more discussions on this. This, I think, will be desirable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Cho for the commentary. You talked about uh, the transnational initiatives in Europe and the implication on uh, Korea. And uh, you talked about uh, some of your ideas on how Eva can actually uh, deep dive in with her research. Next, uh, Dr. Liang. Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Yang Miwa from IFIS. So thank you very much for your presentation, Hisashi Sang. It was a great opportunity uh, to talk uh, to hear more about the changing the motivation behind the change of behavior of North Korea and uh, the changing stance of the U.S. towards North Korea. So I'm not an expert in North Korea, so I would like to ask a few questions uh, from your presentation. First, you said that Biden is likely to take a flexible approach, but at the same time stick to principles. And you also talked about uh, the variables at play since um, South Korean government is likely to change power next year. And I do agree with your uh, prospect for the future. But when it comes to resolving the North Korean issue, of course, um, the benefits that the countries uh, sh can enjoy uh, will determine the future of the strategies for the countries. And now, um, Japan also focuses on the alliance between other countries, and the North Korean regime also uh, focuses on its self-reliance tactic. Now, in the U.S., uh, back in 2019, uh, before the third summit with North Korea, Abe and Trump talked on the phone, and at the time, uh, Bolton said that all the conditions are set uh, for the negotiation, and Prime Minister Abe at the time actually supported the determination of Trump. But then since then, Japan uh, re-emphasized the importance of uh, collaboration between Korea, uh, the U.S., and Japan, and is pressuring North Korea. Now, from your presentation, you said uh, that, well, Japan can actually exert much influence in the U.S.'s policy towards North Korea. But when discussing with North Korea, of course, uh, Japan has limited role to play. But when it comes to other areas such as the nuke of North Korea, what types of incentives we can provide, and how the policy for engagement over pressure, those can be some of the areas where Korea and Japan can collaborate and not conflict. And I believe that that will be the way forward for the two Koreas to resolve the North Korean issue together. So I would like to know about uh, Japan's role uh, in that regard. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Yang, for uh, the commentary and question. So I will give time to Hisashi-san uh, later on for his answer. Next, Professor Lee. Yes, hello, my name is Lee byung -chol. So thank you very much for your presentation, Hirai-san. You've been a long expert on the Korean Peninsula in North Korea, so uh, your presentation was uh, very much in-depth and to the point. Well, I'm not saying that I disagree with what you said, uh, but I would like uh, to uh, give you a few comments on your presentation. Well, actually, uh, this is now the fourth year of Moon Jae-in administration, and the term will end next year. 
the denuk on the Korean Peninsula and the denuk initiative under the Moon administration uh, shows that uh, maybe Moon's ambition was too high. So uh, the talk between the U.S. and North Korea and well, Korea and uh, the U.S. Well, given all the context, Japan uh, has played a passive role uh, to date, and that's also very much shown in Bolton's memoir. And Bolton's book actually um, receives criticism in Japan. But uh, while I was reading his book, I got the impression uh, that he really uh, laid out details about uh, the negotiation process of the U.S. government. So first of all, he talks about uh, the involvement of uh, Japan and uh, that Japan actually meddled in the affairs uh, between the U.S. and North Korea. and. Uh, Japan is maybe a little bit naive when it comes to uh, Korea's policy towards North Korea because Moon Jae-in actually uh, takes a nationalist approach to North Korea, but to Japan, he uh, is quite aggressive. Maybe uh, that stems from the historical conflict with Japan, but Abe's administration and Suga administration actually is a bit naive and uh, actually has uh, takes a dual approach uh, when dealing with South Korea and when dealing with the US. So as you know, Japan um, is quite important uh, given the geological and geopolitical state. Of course, uh, there are some difficulties uh, that are ahead of the country, but Korea and Japan should work together, especially on uh, security, because well, when it comes to U.S. command and U.S. forces, well, uh, they are stationed in Japan, and they will play a, an important role going forward. So, of course, uh, having a combined uh, force between Korea, uh, Japan, and the U.S. will be quite important uh, going forward, and the next administration uh, should not uh, downgrade uh, such importance. And when it comes to North Korea, uh, Japan actually focuses um, their attention very much on the abductee issue, and I understand the reason why, but Japan actually uh, talks a lot about the claim rights and North Korea uh, should uh, be more aggressive and maybe willing to uh, talk with Japan and be open to dialogue with Japan. And I believe that uh, Korea should not uh, be caught up uh, by the nationalist ideal, uh, ideology and the historical issues of the past, and should maybe uh, provide a shuttle diplomacy between Japan and North Korea so that the two uh, countries can converse. So be it a conservative uh, be the next administration uh, be conservative or a radical, I believe that that should be the role of the next uh, government in Korea. And I have a question to you, uh, Hisashi-san. Well, Japan was the first and maybe last country that experienced an atomic bomb. And um, because of such a painful history, uh, Japan is maybe a little bit too passive when it comes to diplomacy and to uh, denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. But I think that Japan should play a, uh, assume a bigger role in uh, the dynamics on the Korean Peninsula. When, when the next administration takes office in Korea, then uh, it may take a hawkish stance uh, towards North Korea. And I believe that uh, the nuclear armament uh, will rise uh, to one of the top agenda um, in the continent 
continent. And Japan should actually assume a bigger role in actually laying out a grander uh, vision for the Northeast Asia uh, denuclearization process. In that sense, uh, Japan has a huge role to play. With the next uh, government taking office, of course, uh, Japan um, will, you know, it will not be easy for uh, Japan to uh, converse uh, with South Korea. But uh, I believe that, you know, be it official or unofficial, uh, there should be a channel for dialogue between the two Koreas. So that means uh, Japan and Korea. So that um, uh, I hope that the older generation should work harder to pave the path forward for the next generation so that um, Koreans do not feel hostile against uh, Japan. So Koreans uh, actually often um, joke about, you know, not never uh, losing to Japan. You can't even lose um, rock, paper, scissors to Japanese. And that's what we joke about, uh, about in Korea. So I believe that it really takes the efforts of all the different generations to work, work together uh, to improve the relations with Japan. With that, I would like to uh, wrap my commentary. Yes, thank you very much for that. So uh, Hisashi-san, I will give you some time later on to answer. Uh, the commentary of Professor Lee. So when you provide your answers, uh, make sure that uh, you uh, address all the questions or comment uh, raised by the panelists. So Professor Lee uh, talked about the importance of Japan playing a bigger role uh, between Korea and North Korea. And as Hirai Sang said, of course, uh, the historical issues between Korea and Japan should be dealt, but it should be dealt separately. So uh, the North Korean issue uh, should be discussed on a side. So uh, the, the Korean and the Japanese government uh, should take a dual approach uh, in terms of negotiations with each other. So now um, the floor is yours, Eva. Uh, please give uh, your answers. Thank you very much. Uh, I will try to be concise with with both my uh, answers and uh, remarks. Uh, so first thing I would like to refer to is uh, applicability of uh, European uh, cases, European experience uh, in North Korea, uh, in uh, Northeast Asia and especially uh, Korean Peninsula. Uh, I 100% agree with both what uh, Pavel and Professor Cho said that one size doesn't fit all. Uh, and that's why I restrain from presenting um, German model of uh, reconciliation, reunification, uh, because I don't think that uh, taking from a German experience is uh, applicable uh, nowadays. But we always can analyze European cases and take those parts of uh, cooperation strategy or uh, managing uh, collaboration projects and to apply it to projects that are already ongoing or either to learn what didn't really work in, in uh, European cases. And again, uh, I've been talking only about European uh, cases due to time constraints, but basically in every uh, border areas in, on every continent, we can find uh, some examples of uh, post-conflict uh, um, transboundary collaboration projects. Uh, we can also refer to Ecuador, Peru cases or Israel, Palestine, not because they were successful and we can just reapply those on Norian, uh, or on Korean Peninsula, but also to learn what failed, why those projects didn't actually work out. Uh, second issue that. Uh, mm, mm, I would like to refer is economic cooperation. 
And again, I, uh, I agree with what Pavel said, that before we go into um, economic cooperation, we should consider small steps policy. So non-political, non-sensitive um, uh, ways of, uh, of uh, cooperation. And when the window of cooperation between uh, either formerly uh, enemy countries or countries like North and South Korea that uh, basically I, are still um, not reconciled, uh, we should start with small steps. So as I mentioned, Helsinki process, which was the biggest uh, platform for formerly uh, a communist uh, countries bloc, uh, countries and, and the West, uh, that started with very, very narrow window of opportunities of non-political, non-economic engagement. So what was it? Um, sport policy, educational exchange, environmental cooperation projects. So uh, this kind of projects might give a good start for a uh, spillover effect, for fostering um, more concrete, more political dialogue. Uh, and also, in that um, regard, I think the engagement of the European Union and European institutions could be, and also should be, more visible, uh, should be more active here in Northeast Asia, on the Korean Peninsula. And also, I would like to address what Professor Cho said. Uh, I just want to explain that the case of access to East Asian, Australasian flyaway partnership wasn't presented to criticize South Korean government. Uh, I talked about it just to show that trust building process should be tackled with more holistic approach and also should be tackled on different levels from community levels going gradually to uh, government, governmental levels. Uh, yeah, I think I can stop here. If there are more comments or remarks, then I would also address those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, for the answers. Yes, so when it comes to inter-Korean relations and the Korean Peninsula, we have to learn from West and East Germany. And we have been learning much from that case. But uh, Eva looked in depth into Europe so that we can address uh, the challenges uh, in Korea. And I believe that we have much to learn. Next, uh, Hisashi Sang. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Liang asked questions about the diplomatic relations between uh, North Korea and Japan. So any possibility for dialogue between the two and uh, what they can do for denuclearization? Well, actually, of course, uh, a lot of people think that war is over in Japan, but that is a mistake because we have much to resolve uh, before actually move forward. And in um, striking a diplomatic ties with uh, North Korea, we have to first resolve the issue of adoption and second, uh, Nucle uh, nuclear weapons. So now, given that North Korea uh, possess nuclear weapons, can we actually sit at the negotiation table with the regime? And uh, can we talk with the regime uh, when the abductee issue uh, has not been resolved? Well, the J Japanese government and the Japanese people 
understand that a denuclearization is the path forward. And I'm sure that the majority of the people agree to that. And denuclearization uh, is key to bringing security uh, to Japan. And of course, uh, in that sense, Japan is willing to contribute to the process for denuclearization. And once denuclearization process become visible, then of course uh, it will entail cost. And Japan, um, be it whatever cabinet, I'm sure that uh, they will be willing to uh, pay its share. But I would like to ask the Korean government uh, this. So under Lee Myung-bak administration, President Lee requested that Japan pays a large share uh, for the denuclearization process. However, now uh, we can we should not mix denuclearization as well as other political affairs. Denuclearization is one approach that we need to change, uh, and the relation with Japan is another matter that we need to deal with. So uh, the two agenda should not be mixed. And I'm sure that North Korea will not agree uh, with that approach. So if we are to agree on the path for denuclearization, again, uh, Japan will be willing to contribute. And I'm sure that uh, Japan will be able to play a role in that process. Next, uh, Professor Lee also uh, gave me some commentaries and well, what would be the role of the Japanese citizens? Now, um, the sticking issues um, between Korea and Japan is quite challenging because now um, Korea's nationalism is quite progressive uh, and uh, Japanese uh, nationalism is very conservative and you see the huge discrepancy between the two. So it's not just a clash between two um, different and opposing nationalism, but um, the nature of uh, the na nationalism differs between the two countries. That's what makes it so uh, complex. So when it comes to the historical issues, and uh, discussion with North Korea. Well, if a conservative government takes office uh, next year, I believe that uh, we can maybe expect uh, a better relationship next year. And even if another progressive government was to take office next year here in Korea, Unless it's radical, uh, I believe that we might be able to uh, make little progress, but not much. So, of course, uh, the citizens of Japan will do their job. And will do what they can do, but it's a shame that uh, the North Korean issue is not uh, something quite relevant to the everyday life of the uh, Japanese citizens. And now, unless denuclearization becomes a determining factor, 
on uh, Japan. I don't think that Japan will take an aggressive role in resolving that issue. And now the younger generation uh, have not experienced war, and that it is why uh, they are reluctant uh, about war. And they have strong determination uh, for peace. So uh, if North Korea's nuclear weapons poses a serious threat to Japan, then uh, the Japanese people might take action. But until then, um, the level of awareness is uh, quite low. And I agree with what the professor said. Yes, I think that that should be our way forward. But the reality in Japan is uh, quite challenging. Thank you very much for that, uh, Hirai-san, for your answers. Thank you for the detailed answer about the uh, commentaries. And actually, this topic what, uh, has been raised throughout this session. It's a key uh, topic. So depending on the future of the inter-Korean relations and denuclearization process, we have to choose our way forward. So in that sense, our discussion uh, can be quite valuable in paving the way forward. So with that, uh, uh, we've uh, finished one round of panel discussion session, but uh, we have about nine more minutes to go because this session ends at uh, 1220. So I would like to ask uh, the audience to ask questions by using this QR code. We have received one question. After the national election next year, well, actually, uh, Hisashi-san talked about uh, Korea's national election and the election in Japan this fall, and you said that that can change uh, the landscape. Well, let's say that power changes next year, then what would be the trend for Korea, China, and Japan's relations? Uh, so do you think that the dynamics between Korea, Japan, and China change uh, if power changes next year in Korea? Well, as well, Hisashi-san is expert on this, so please provide an answer to this question. Do you think that the relationship between Korea, Japan, and China will change if uh, the Korean government changes power next year? So is, is it Korea, China, and Japan? Yes. Well, for Korea, US, and Japan, I think that there will be some progress uh, for North Korea policy, but for Korea, Japan, and China, well, they will have to talk about uh, climate change and environmental issues. So uh, non-North Korea issues, I think they will make progress. However, the change of government in uh, Japan is quite likely in uh, Japan. However, although there will be some changes of uh, the power in Japan, it will be within LDP. So what Biden uh, keeps saying uh, is that uh, the U.S. will remain its stance against China. And I believe that that will not change for, for uh, the foreseeable future. And actually, uh, under Abe, uh, there were discussions about the uh, East Asian Initiative and so forth, but LDP is not likely to uh, make huge progress on denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that. 
So we haven't received any more questions. So with that, I would like to wrap up uh, this session. So Eva talked about uh, Europe's case um, and how it can affect uh, the inter-Korean relations. And of course, cooperation and collaboration will be key uh, to keep the conversation alive with North Korea. However, one foot for thought is this. North Korea is also undergoing huge change, and the landscape on the Korean Peninsula is changing. The US, uh, Korea, and uh, Japan also keep changing, and uh, their aspirations keep changing, especially amid a uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Countries around the world are struggling to fight uh, the virus, and because of that, uh, transnational uh, cooperation has been dampened. And since we haven't seen any progress in the inter-Korean relations, uh, we are still um, maintaining the level of sanction on North Korea. So the economic cooperation between the two Koreas and cooperation and dialogue between the US and North Korea and the cooperation between the US and Japan, cooperation between North Korea and Japan, I mean, will they be able to maintain uh, the current level of uh, relationship? Or I believe that uh, the paradigm will change for all these types of relationships. So to make progress in terms of the inter-Korean relations, uh, we have to break away from what we used to do in the past. We have to incorporate the changes uh, surrounding us and move forward accordingly. As uh, Biden's office kicked off, the policies have uh, started to change. and cooperation with China and economic cooperation with China has now emerged as a key and a pivotal factor. And Korea, Japan, as well as Northeast Asia, how will these countries uh, play? What, what roles will these play in that dynamic? I believe that that will have huge implications on the Korean Peninsula. And as Hirai Sang mentioned, in that sense, the relationship between the two Koreas and the relationship between North Korea and uh, Japan uh, should change in accordance with the la changing landscape. And up to 2017, it was um, our nation first. Um, it was nationalism. And as of 2017, when North Korea declared that it was ready, it was a full uh, swing nuclear state, then everything changed. And during the 8th Congress of the party, um, the regime talked about its um, North Korea first uh, tactic and strategy. So it has now focused on self-reliance, and that has become the new propaganda motto for the regime. North Korea will keep uh, pursuing new goals against uh, the challenging circumstances, and it is um, quite likely that uh, the regime will keep doing so uh, given the difficult uh, circumstances uh, in the regime. And against that backdrop, uh, without a very reasonable paradigm, we won't be able to change, uh, to address uh, the challenges such as denuclearization. So now Eva talked about uh, the case of Europe so that we can learn from that case. And uh, Hirai Sang talked about um, the different uh, dynamics of uh, relations uh, between the countries in the uh, Northeast Asia. So you gave us an overview of uh, the landscape and uh, emphasized the importance of having a, keeping the dialogue alive between Korea and Japan. Anyways, um, Korea, the US, and Japan should uh, keep uh, the cooperation level to address uh, the upcoming challenges. And uh, we have to em emphasize uh, the importance of such relationship. And it is against that backdrop uh, that we need to make policy decisions 
decisions and uh, learn from uh, previous cases uh, to get ready for the future challenges. So in that sense, I believe that the presentations today and the panel discussion um, gave us much implications and much to learn. So I would like to thank the presenters uh, for the great presentations and the great ideas um, proposed by the panelists. Thank you very much for joining us uh, despite your busy schedule. Thank you very much, um, Eva and Hirai Sang, for your time. And thank you very much, panelists, for providing us uh, with uh, valuable inputs. Thank you very much. And. Uh, we ask for your um, support uh, for KGFP. And uh, with that, uh, we would like to wrap up this session. Thank you very much.